Matthew 21 through 16. In my Bible, it's called the parable of the workers in the vineyard. But let's uh, look at the screen and let's say the memory verse we're learning together this summer. Let's say it together. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. And take it away. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. When we focus ourselves on what's really important, God will take care of all the other things that we would normally worry about. And now Matthew 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to give them or pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. The, the hours, the number of hours, that's at, uh, the working hours throughout the day uh, that people would normally work. And then about the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. So the workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. That's the average pay for a day's wage. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Well, it's not fair that people were paid differently for those different amounts of work. Imagine at your job working one hour and getting a full day's worth of pay. Imagine what that would be like. Now imagine working a full day and getting the same as someone who worked one hour. It's not fair. It's not right. If you work longer, you should get paid for those hours. We're making slackers equal to the hard workers. And that just rubs us the wrong way. But something that seems to be all over the Bible, not just in this parable, although it's illustrated here, is that God is not what we would call fair. He's just and good. By our standards, God isn't fair necessarily. He's not fair. He's good. And we're very fortunate that He isn't fair and that He is good. Just some things to throw um, at this story to put it into some sort of context. Back then, people waited at a specific place to be hired for the day. So, there was some corner somewhere in the city where 
people who didn't have a job would go and they would just stand there because employers would come by needing help from the surrounding countryside and they would say, okay, I need, I need three workers. Who's, who's going to come with me? And they'll be mobbed, of course. And so they'll just look and say, okay, you, you, and you. And then they would go away and then there'd be others who would come too. And so for people who had no employment, that was their best bet. And the worker's greatest humiliation, the worst thing for one of those workers is to return to a hungry family with nothing. So imagine you stood there all day and nobody hired you. And so you had to go home to your wife and to your kids and they're hungry and you have to say, I didn't get a job today. We're going to have to go to bed hungry tonight. So every morning, different foremen came to hire only as many workers as needed. Every morning, the foreman would come and they would hire how many people were needed. And those assembled workers, they would swarm around the foreman just hoping to be chosen. Apparently, this is still goes on in Palestine today. And most often, there wouldn't be anybody returning. So if one foreman came and said, I need three people, he wouldn't come back and say, uh, I need one more. That usually didn't happen at all. And efficient landowners know how many people are needed for the day's work. So if you're a responsible foreman, you know exactly what needs to be done today, you know how many people it's going to take, and you only hire that many because you don't want to hire people to stand there doing nothing. Now most people waiting to be hired give up and leave by noon. So if you were standing there, if you were one of those people who needed a job, didn't have one, and were just hoping that maybe somebody would pick you to give you some sort of work of some kind, if nobody picked you up by noon, then that was a sign that nobody's going to pick you up. And so most workers are gone by noon. The fact that there were workers there at the sixth hour and the ninth hour and the eleventh hour is pretty remarkable. At the eleventh hour, standing and wait for work shows eagerness and desperation. So whoever was standing there at that last hour, there's only one working hour left in the day. Because once the sun goes down, it's no use working anymore. They didn't have lights like we do. And so working in the dark was not really a feasible thing. So those who were standing there were very eager and desperate. Here's what they might have been thinking. We're eager to work. We're willing to work, ready to work, able to work, and we will not give up. We will stand here until the light fades and go home in the dark if we have to. So there's a persistence with these 11th hour workers. This landowner who represents God in this parable is most unusual. He doesn't operate as usual landowners would. And our God doesn't usually operate the way that we expect him to always either. First of all, this landowner, he goes to hire workers himself. And many times... Most landowners, they send their foreman to do the hiring. They don't go themselves. And most only go once. They don't go again and again and again. That's wasting money. So here we have a landowner who goes there himself and goes there many times. That's weird. That's unusual. 
It's even, as one commentary put it, unheard of. And it's not that he needs more workers, but because more people need work. He's going out to hire people because he knows that they are hoping to return home with some sort of money to feed their families. He doesn't need more work. Just as kind of a side note, people who are poor that we know, they are human beings and they need dignity more than money. People who are poor around us, they need dignity more than they need money. And so to just hand poor, a poor person some cash is really to make them feel more poor. It's demeaning. This manager, instead of just throwing some money at him, which he could have done, he gives them a job. He gives them work to do. That's dignity. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to work for our money. That we can have something that we can do and contribute. If money's handed to you, it's like saying you've got nothing to contribute. Here's just something to keep yourself alive. He doesn't give handouts. There's a book that's on poverty that Deirdre and I both have read her in dealing with uh, families and students at her school and, uh, and for myself as, as the church deals with different kinds of families from time to time. It says that there's different classes here. There's a poor culture. There's a culture of being poor. There's a culture of being middle class. And there's a culture of being wealthy. And each one has its own rules and its own ways of doing things and seeing things. And it says, the key to membership for individuals from poverty is in creating relationships with them. If you want to help somebody who's in poverty, create a relationship with them. Because poverty is about relationships as well as entertainment. The most significant motivator for individuals is relationships. In order to go from one category to another, you almost need somebody who's going to show you the ropes or, say, or ask you the questions. Okay, why are you spending your money that way instead of this way? Um, this is what I do with my money. Um, you know, what, why is it that you do it that way? But a friendship. Anyways, this foreman, not the foreman, the landowner, he pays the one-hour workers first while the all-day workers are still in line. This is weird. He says to the foreman, call the workers and let's pay them their wages. And we're going to start with the last ones hired, the ones at the 11th hour. And then we're going to go to the first ones hired. Okay, that's kind of almost a recipe for a riot. That, that's really, on human terms, that's really kind of a foolish move on his part. So these people who worked one hour are receiving a denarius. They're, they're getting paid as if they had worked the whole day. And so the people in the back are looking ahead and say, oh, well, if they're getting a denarius, I'm going to probably get two. But then they all receive the same. Now, all this owner, this landowner had to do was to pay the first workers first and the last ones last. There would have been no problem then because these people would have expected to receive a denarius, a full day's work. They would have received it and been like, all right, I'm good. They would have taken off and then other people would also receive a denarius and they'd be like, whoa, this is great. And then finally the people who worked one hour would receive it 
And they would think, wow, this guy is really generous, but everybody else is all gone already. It's almost like he's rubbing the unfairness, or what we would think is unfair, in the first workers' faces. He paid the first, if he paid the first ones first, they wouldn't be in line to see the others getting paid more. The master is teaching the workers his love and grace. He's trying to make a point to them. So some of us have been raised in the church. We've been raised to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We've learned how to trust in Him for a long time. And there is going to be people who are going to have who are going to suddenly realize Christ is their Lord at the 11th hour, and they're going to receive the same reward as us. And God wants us to see that He's going to reward all people the same. So here's some things for us today. By definition... Grace is not fair. We talk about grace a lot. It's by grace that we are saved. The sacraments that we celebrate, even like the one we did today, the one we're going to do next week, this is about grace, God's free gift of salvation to us that was paid for by Jesus Christ. We talk about grace a lot, but really, it's not fair. Grace is not fair. It's not fair that Jesus had to die on a cross, of all things, for the things that we did when he was innocent. Perfectly innocent Son of God dying on the cross for what we did, that's not fair. We don't think it's unfair because we're the beneficiaries of it. But talk about unfair to him. If we asked God for fairness, if we really wanted what's fair, then we would be getting eternal punishment for the sins that we've committed. That's fair. Jesus took our place. That's not fair. That's grace. That's God being good. Just like the landowner, God comes to us himself. In Jesus Christ. You know, this, most landowners, they send their foreman out there to do the hiring. Here's this landowner. He goes himself to hire the people. He goes himself. We have a God who came to us in Jesus Christ. He was the Son of God. Or God the Son. And other religions, if, like for example, Mormons and Muslims, those started because an angel appeared to one prophet. If you're a Mormon or a Muslim, you believe that the great prophet ahead of you was visited by an angel. God didn't come himself, he sent an angel. We believe that our God came himself. And not just to deliver a message, but to pay the whole price for us. So like a parent who bends down to speak to a child, our God bends down to be with us. And we don't have any reason to grumble against our God because people who had an 11th hour conversion while we were working all day get the same reward. Working for the Lord is its own reward. I didn't put that on the screen, but that's maybe something you could write down. Working for the Lord is its own reward. We are much better off working for the Lord than feasting with anyone else. 
As one of the Psalms says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in tents with the wicked. And we don't belong because we work. This is important. We work because we belong. God has hired us, according to this parable. We already belong. We're already his, his workers. And we work because we belong. It's not, okay, you better do a good job, and then we'll see, we'll see how well you did. And if uh, you didn't do a good enough job, then forget about you. Colossians 3, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Tomorrow's Labor Day. And some of us maybe love our jobs. Some of us are kind of like, eh, there's good days and bad days. Some of us hate our jobs. I've had jobs that I've hated. And Labor Day was... Like this wonderful day, wonderful extra day where I didn't have to go to work. That was awesome. But no matter whether you hate your job or love it, you're working for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. That was said to slaves. People who did the most menial stuff that there is to do. Cleaning toilets, sweeping floors, just the stuff that nobody else wanted to do. We work because we belong. We need a relationship with God also, not handouts. We need a relationship with God. God isn't just throwing out tickets to heaven here. God wants us to build a relationship with us. So he says, come, and work with me in my vineyard. And in so doing, he's going to teach us what love and grace actually are. Working for the Lord is, is its own reward. Philippians 3.8, I consider everything, ever, absolutely everything, a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Nothing compares. And just like it's better to work for money than to get a handout, it's better to belong to Christ than just get to heaven. Working in the Lord's vineyard, we are much better off. We're getting to know the Lord God Almighty. It doesn't matter whether other people are working more or less. If we're working there in the Lord's vineyard, we're getting our own reward already. We're not just getting tickets to heaven. We're getting to know him. And in getting to know him, we're come, becoming to be like him. It's work, but it's work with purpose, with dignity and meaning that brings real rewards, not just a paycheck. Ephesians 1, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. The riches of his glorious inheritance. We've got a huge reward coming. Just to relay one more thing. Again, our God is gracious. He's not fair by our standards. And thank God he's not. Because fair would be the last thing that we wanted. Our God gives us grace and salvation. And we ought to just be totally blown away and grateful for it. Let's bow our heads together. Lord God in heaven, we have ideas about what it means to be fair. And obviously you want us to 
treat others with respect and fairness. But, but Lord, you've gone beyond fairness. And you've shown us grace and goodness. And so, Lord, we pray that we would see your grace and goodness, even the kind that you do in the lives of others, and that we would be inspired by it and want to be like that. We pray that we would not work grudgingly, but that we would work because it's its own reward, because we are getting to know you and draw nearer to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.